I loved all of the Indiana Jones films because they were full of adventure and they were full of uh, energy. And Harrison Ford really captured that particular character. All of the films were fundamentally the same. There were some prize artifacts that Indiana Jones, uh, from his archaeological orientation, was desperate to get his hands on, something of high value. What made the movies particularly gratifying and interesting and challenging was the fact that he had to overcome a lot of obstacles to get to the artifacts. There were spears and guns and there was arrows and swords and bad people. And these bad people were all trying to block him getting to this precious possession. And when I thought of that series of movies, it reminded me of the fact that you and I have a precious possession that your enemy doesn't want you to find. That you have some things available to you he doesn't want you to get at and he will use no limits to stop you from picking up the prized possession God has for you. In our series on the cross, it's called Returning to the Cross, we are talking about what the role of the cross of Christ is for you today. Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 has a run-on sentence from verses 3 to verse 12. He goes on and on and on. In English, you call that a run-on sentence. He just, he just can't stop talking. And it's all about what we, the prized possession that believers have because of the cross. Because of what Jesus has done, he goes in chapter 1, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And he goes on and on and on, bam, 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 bam. One thing right after another and he just can't, he just can't quit. He just can't stop. So the sentence goes on and on and on and on. He is just beside himself. But then he stops in verse 18 and he says these words, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. It dawns on him. I'm all excited about something and these people may not know what in the world I'm talking about. They, I don't want them to miss this. This is too big. So in the middle of his excitement, he stops to pray and says, Lord, for the Christians at the church at Ephesus, would you please help them to understand what I'm talking about? Because I don't want them to miss this. In his excitement, he knew God was going to have to open up their eyes lest they hear it and miss it. He spent the first section of the chapter talking about the cross and all the privileges and rights and benefits that come. And he even says in 14, about the Holy Spirit who delivers these benefits, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. In other words, God doesn't want you to have to go to heaven before you taste it. He says a pledge of your inheritance. The word pledge, the Greek word pledge means down payment. God wants you to have a down payment now of the heaven you're going to. If you are a Christian now, that means you're on your way to heaven. God doesn't want you to get there to have to wait to feel what it feels like. So he's given you a down payment or a pledge or a piece of heaven that's been allocated to you now. Back up to verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Who has blessed us, who has blessed us, who has blessed us. Everything God is ever going to do for you, he's already done. Notice the word ED is on the word blessed. It has already occurred. It has already been banked. It's already on deposit. It is already in the vault with your name on it. Everything God is ever going to do for you in time has already been placed in the deposit box called your inheritance. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you are an inheritor of a portion of his will that 
has been bequeathed to you as the risen son of God. He says that God has made a provision for you that is not only for heaven, but that is also a pledge that you are to participate in in history. It's already been made available. So Paul says, let me pray that these folk understand what I'm talking about. I pray that uh, the eyes of their heart, really on the inside, they'll be illuminated. That means the light comes on, the switch is turned on, that they see clearly so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. He wants you to know what God has provided for you. So does anybody in here want to know about your down payment? Anybody in here want to know about your will? Anybody in here wants to know what's been allocated to your account? Well, that's what he wants. He wants the saints to know what God has provided. Notice this, the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. He wants us to know the surpassing greatness of his power. Let me say that again. He wants you and I to know the surpassing greatness of his power. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say he wants you to know his power. He says he wants you to know his surpassing greatness of his power. In other words, he wants you to know superpower. He wants you not average power, not academic power. He wants you to know how God can flip things, flap things, turn things, twist things. He wants you to know what it is when God comes out of nowhere to bring something up to somewhere in your life. One of the things Paul says should be a testimony of every Christian, and it shouldn't be a rare thing. It should be something you can be able to talk about on a regular basis is his uh, surpassing greatness of his power. When he did something abnormal, when he did something out of the ordinary, when he did something that's downright ridiculous, when he did something that you couldn't bank on, think about, plan for, or contemplate, he wants you to understand what he says in chapter 3, the height, the depth, the breath. He wants you to see his surpassing power. All right? So you're not supposed to be an average human being. You're not supposed to be just a normal run-of-the-mill guy or girl. You're not supposed to be just like everybody else. You're supposed to be able to talk about the surpassing power of our great God. And guess what he says? That surpassing power is in the will. It's part of your inheritance. It's part of your bequeath. It's part of what he's making available to all the saints. So if you're here, you're a saint. You belong to Jesus Christ today. You are a candidate for surpassing power. You are a candidate for not to be an average individual. Well, what does that look like? He goes even further. He says, the surpassing greatness of his power to those who believe, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, what he can do, which he brought about in Christ. So now, he wants to illustrate what he means by surpassing power. Follow this which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. He says, you want to know what surpassing power looks like? He says, look at Jesus. Jesus was crucified. Jesus was nailed to the cross. But Friday didn't determine where things wound up circumstances, look, Friday was a bad day for Jesus, all right? It was a bad day physically. He was beaten to a pulp. It was a bad day emotionally. He cried tears like blood, sweats of blood uh, in in the garden of uh, Gethsemane. It was a really bad day spiritually. He was separated from his father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was a bad day emotionally. His, his, His posse, his homeboys, they left him. They ran away. They were nowhere to be found. He lost his friends. He lost his life. Body beaten to a pulp. Separated from his father. I call Friday a bad day. But Friday wasn't the last day. It was a bad day. Because according to the verse, it says, the surpassing greatness of his power when he raised Jesus up from the dead. In other words, God reversed the day. It started off bad Friday. It wound up awesome Sunday because God did a miracle in between Friday and Sunday that raised up something that had totally died. Now, I know some of you came to church here beaten and broken. 
Some of it came this morning emotionally beaten, physically beaten, attitudinally beaten, spiritually beaten, relationally beaten. You've come broke down, beat up, toe up from the flow up. Circumstances have not been in your favor. But Paul says, I want you to know the surpassing greatness of his power. And it's the same power that was working when he raised Jesus Christ up from the dead or turned death in the life, bad into good, worse in the better. He flipped the script and turned things around. And he ties it to the person of Jesus Christ. Watch this now, because it gets gooder. He ties it to Jesus Christ. He says he raised him from the dead seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Oh, it was enough to say he rose. I'd be happy with that. But he said, that's not the end of the story. We have a doctrine of the death. We have a doctrine of the resurrection. What we're often lacking is a, is a doctrine of the ascension. After he rose from the dead, he stepped on a cloud, as you recall, and was lifted up to the third heaven and was seated at the right hand of the Father. Now that may not sound like a lot, but that's a whole lot. See, in the Old Testament, when the priest went into the presence of God, you'll find a lot of furniture. What you won't find is a chair. In other words, the priest couldn't sit down because his work was never finished. So there was no provision for the priest to sit when the priest was in the presence of God because he wasn't finished. But on the cross, Jesus said, to tell us thy. That's the Greek word that means it is finished or paid in full. In other words, the work was so complete, Jesus, God told Jesus, take a seat. You're finished. The work was completely finished. Now that may sound good and all that, but that's the question. Is what does that got to do with me? Well, remember, he started this discussion with a statement, I want you to know his surpassing power. I don't want you to miss out on what the death and resurrection means for you. That he came and met him in a bad situation. He died. He raised him from the dead and put him in a relaxed state where he's not worrying and he's not anxious. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. You know, I, I got uh, mailed to me uh, uh, some time ago an American Airline Advantage book. Now, this tells me all the advantages that come to me as a platinum flyer with American Airlines. It is a book of benefits that accrue to me because I'm a platinum flyer with American Airlines. I threw the book on the side because uh, I just wanted to fly when I needed to fly and then fine and that's good and, and all that. I never picked up to look at the benefits. I just accepted what I knew in my own head. I decided a few days ago because I ran across it to thumb through the book only to discover there are benefits that have accrued to me that I was not aware of. There were opportunities for me to take advantage of that I was not using. There were upgrades that I had that I was unaware of. All because I failed to investigate what my relationship offered. And because I failed to investigate what my relationship offered, my inheritance from American Airlines was not fully being experienced, realized, or utilized. I discovered the same problem with my car. I have a basic belief. You get in the car to drive it. There is a book, an owner's manual, inside the glove compartment of my car. Have I ever read that owner's manual? Absolutely not. Because my only concern was getting in, starting it up, driving the way I need to go. But I just thumbing through the book. I haven't even read it yet. I just thumbed through it to discover there were parts on my car I didn't even know were on there. There were things that my car can do I didn't know it could do and I certainly didn't know how to do it. All because I never picked up to investigate all the privileges of the relationship that I have with my automobile. It is unfortunate that Christians come to church every Sunday and every Wednesday still functioning basic. Not knowing all the rights and privileges that is inherited that God has ordained and bequeathed in his will for all the saints that involve God's uh, surpassing power. See, what the cross provides you and me is the opportunity to see what God can do out 
of the normal, out of the regular, out of the everyday-ish of life, and how he can invade the circumstances of life just like he invaded the tomb of Jesus when he died on the cross and flipped things around turn them, twist them, tweak them so that his mighty power see a lot of us sing about his power talk about his power amen his power but we can't testify to his power because we've never seen him flip turn, twist, tweak something so that he did something that was beyond human comprehension but he says that's in your will it's in your will his super imposing power now The Bible is basically divided into two parts. Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, they were looking forward. They were looking futuristic. There was anticipation of God's final provision. All the sacrifices, all the ceremonies were in anticipation of God's uh, uh, entrance in the history. But those of us who live today in the new covenant, the new testament, we look back. We look back to the cross as the basis for everything else God is going to do to, with, through, and for you. It is all tied to our relationship to the cross. When you lose sight of what happened there, you can't fully experience it here. When you lose sight of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, you're going to lose sight of your inheritance right now and you're going to be, I'm going to be like every other human being, trying to make it, trying to deal with it, doing the best I can. Okay? He says he wants you to know the surpassing power of his greatness. So I just want to know, is anybody here who wants to know their inheritance? What has been equipped to them? Okay, watch this now. Watch this. What did Jesus accomplish? He tells you in verse 20, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Watch this now, watch this. Far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Please notice, he's talking about two time zones. This age, you're living right now, and the eternal age, the age that is to come. So we're not just talking about heaven, we're talking about what Jesus is accomplishing today on our behalf in this age, living right here in the nasty here and now. Now watch this. He says, Jesus Christ was seated after his ascension far above all rule, authority, dominion, and power. Okay, I said that too fast. Jesus Christ is now sitting far above all rule, authority, dominion, and power. In other words, no matter how high anybody in your world is, they are not the final authority. Because there is somebody sitting far above all rule of authority, dominion, and power, which means whatever you're dealing with, whoever you're dealing with does not have the last say. Why? Because however big they are, however mighty they are, there is somebody sitting not above, far above, way higher than all rule, authority, dominion, and power. Well, if one man in one city can affect the nation and the world politically, what do you think the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords can do sitting high, far above all rule and all authority? Now that changes my perspective because that means what you say is our word, it's not the last word. What you think is a thought, it's not the last thought. What I say is a word, but it's not the final word. Because I know somebody, and you know somebody, who is now seated in the executive chair, far above all rule, authority, and dominion, and power. 
which is why you can't afford to live a depressed life because you know somebody who can overrule somebody who look like they're ruling you. You know of somebody who can overrule a circumstance that right now looks like it's ruling you because you know somebody who's far above all rule, authority, dominion, and power. Okay? You know somebody, listen to this, who has final authority. You know somebody who has veto power. All right? Okay. Let me clarify something. Let me clarify the difference between power and authority. You need to know the difference. Because there is a difference. Authority has to do with the right to use power. Okay? Authority is the right to use power. You've heard me say it, but let me say it again. Referees are not the strongest men on the football field. They're not the strongest men on the football field. They're not the fastest. They're older, slower, and fatter. Okay? I mean, that's the way it is. But when they throw out the yellow flag, the bigger people have to stop. The faster people have to slow down. They shut the whole thing down. Because while they don't have their power, they have greater authority. In other words, the authority overrules the power. The fact that the men are bigger and faster. Look, you may be driving a faster car, and you may be a bigger man, but if you see those lights behind you, you better pull over. Because the fact that you have a newer, faster car becomes irrelevant when the authority is behind you. See, authority overrules power. You can't overrule the devil by power. He's a spirit being, and by, by sheer strength, you're going to lose every time. But when it comes to authority, that's a different story. See, a lot of people are looking for the wrong thing. They're looking for power when you need to exercise authority. That's different. And the reason why we're losing more than winning is that we're looking for power and not the rightful use of authority. And it's authority. Come on, turn your Bibles of Colossians chapter 2. I don't want you to miss this. Colossians chapter 2. Let me show you about the cross and how it relates to all this. Verse 13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which were hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he has dis disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Therefore, let no one is to act as your judge in regard to food and drink, or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things that are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belong to Christ. Now watch this. He says he forgave your transgressions, watch this now, and the certificate of ordinances were canceled that had been written against you when he nailed it to the cross. Now watch this now. That's taken from a Roman tradition. In Rome, if you were incarcerated for a crime, they would put you in lockup, then they would write a certificate of decrees. These were the crimes you were guilty of. This man is in prison because he killed, raped, murdered, stole, whatever it was. There would be this registered certification of your actions that caused you to be incarcerated. That was the certificate your, uh, of, of sins that you had committed that was causing you to be on lockdown. But the text says on the cross, Jesus Christ ripped up the certificate that was against you. Now, why do you need to know Jesus Christ ripped them up at the cross? Because that's the certificate that the devil uses to keep God from acting on your behalf. God, you can't do anything for Tony Evans because he did this, 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 this. To which Jesus can say, yeah, but 
this, 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 and this was addressed at the cross. So you can't use this, 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 and this to stop me from doing this, 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 and this because I've already canceled this, 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 and this on the cross. You can't use that to hold him hostage. But if you don't know what the cross has canceled, okay, let me help you, let me help you, let me help you. Okay. On the cross, it says, Jesus Christ tore down the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places. So Satan now has to come at you with an unloaded gun, but he's not going to tell you that. He wants you to think you you never going to make it. He wants you to think you're never going to overcome. He wants you to think you're always going to be defeated. He wants you to think you're never going to have victory. He wants you to think depression has came down in your family and it's now come down to you and you're never going to improve. He's going to want you to think that like your daddy, like your granddaddy, like your mama, like your grandmama, you're just destined for failure. And you're looking at that gun and saying, yeah, yeah, stick them up, stick them up, stick them up. Jesus wants you to know that no bullets in that gun that he was disarmed it says he was disarmed at the cross Satan his demons and his human followers are not the last word Your boss is not the last word. The economy is not the last word. Your circumstances are not the last word. High above all rule and authority. Jesus Christ sits as ruler. Am I saying that you should have no problems? I'm saying no. I'm just saying like Jesus, even though you have problems, God wants you to teach you to walk on water, not drown in water. He wants you to be on top of it, not it on top of you. And see, that's, that, see, that gives you something to praise him for. See, in the middle of a bad situation, your first motivation shouldn't be to complain. It should be to praise. Praise what? That this is not the last word. Now, it's a word. It's a bad word. But it ain't the final word. Because I know somebody high and above all rule and authority who gets to make the last call on this matter. And you see, this changes your whole approach to life. See, when you relate back to the cross that Jesus, that's why it says in Revelation 12 verse 11, they overcame him by the blood. That's a cross. They overcame him because they never lost sight that that cross means devil and demons and even your human followers who bring in hell in my life. All y'all are not the last word. All y'all. Not the last word. You you are not you know you are not to live in defeat. Yeah, you're gonna have moments, you're gonna have seconds, you may have some days, but that's not supposed to define your life. Not when there's somebody high above all rule, authority, dominion, and power who has the last say so. And until he says so, it ain't so. Uh, until he gives the final word on the subject. See, and that, that's why that's why. You don't have to live an intimidated life, especially with people. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you're not supposed to let the devil intimidate you, and you can't even see him, he can sneak up on you. If you can't not even let the devil, how are you going to let any of the devil's folk in, uh, intimidate you? Respect all people. Be intimidated by no man. Because you know a man who sits high above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. Because the cross canceled out the certificate that was written against you. It's been canceled. Paid in full. That's why the Bible says when you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. And that's why the Bible says the devil is a liar because he wants you to believe the lie is the truth because if you believe the lie is the truth, you'll function on the lie and you won't get the benefits of the truth. And the truth, of course, is always based on God's word. That's authority. Are you hearing me today? What God wants you to know is that what that cross has provided is victory over your enemies and Jesus Christ is seated. You say, but that's good for Jesus, but what about me? Turn back to Ephesians. Turn back to Ephesians. Just want to give you a last word. Can I give you a last word? 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, just to remind you, I know you know it. Verse 5, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has some chairs beside him. And one of them is yours. It says we have been spiritually relocated. Here it is. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. You say, why am I not having any victory? Because you don't know where you're seated. See, you're still sitting on earth. So you're functioning like an earthling. Okay? He says spiritually, not physically. Physically, you are on earth. But spiritually, you have been seated with Christ in heavenly places. And where is Christ seated? Far above all rule, authority, dominion, and power. He's seated up there. You are seated with him. Which means you must approach life spiritually in order to get spiritual authority. If you want spiritual authority, you've got to do it from that seat up there. You can't do it from this seat down here. But people will come into this seat in here and go out there and live by that seat that is on earth. Earth's seat doesn't give you authority. It makes you like any other human being. But when you operate on Christ's view of a matter, when you operate by divine authority, which has taken away the devil and his emissary's authority over your life, then you can speak with authority until God gives the last word. That's why when God shows me something that I'm convinced that God has shown me, the fact that people have said no becomes an irrelevant discussion. The fact that people say it can't happen, that becomes an irrelevant conclusion. Until I get final word from the one who sits far above all rule and authority and dominion and power, this discussion is still open. This has not closed. It may be closed for you for now. It changes your whole approach to life. You, you, walk, you don't walk in defeat. You walk in victory. Because it's far above all rule and authority. Now, how is this different from name and claim it? Because, you know, you got name and claim it out here. Well, I, I name it and claim it. You can't claim what you name. You can only claim what he's approved. Okay? You just can't be making up stuff along the way. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about spiritual authority over anything the devil wants to keep you from experiencing as part of your legitimate heritage as a Christian. And we're going to talk about some of those blessings as we go along. You know, I'm into football and I came home uh, the other day and, you know, my first station is always DirecTV 212 NFL Network. Okay? The station that all real men look at. And so I turned it on and they were showing a game between the St. Louis Rams and the New England Patriots. They were showing this game. So I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm watching the football game. And the game is getting ready to come on. The announcer comes on and says, we're getting ready to show the replay of this game between the St. Louis Rams and the New England Patriots and how the New England Patriots came back to win and overrule the, uh, the onslaught of the St. Louis Rams, which means... Before the game has begun, I know where it's ending. See, I know where this thing is going. Because I've been told on the front end what the back end is going to look like. So now I'm sitting there watching the game unfold, but I know where it's going. So even though there were some fumbles, I know where this is going. Even though there were some interceptions by the uh, Brady threw some interceptions, that was bad. I still know where this is going. Even though there was some mess up and some sacks, I'm not all, I ain't getting all shook up and I ain't getting all, because I've already been told by the announcer where this thing is going. So while it's going there, there are some bumps. While it's going there, there are some failures. While it's going there, there are some defeats. But those failures and defeats don't define 
where things are going to wind up because I've already been told in advance by the announcer where this thing is going. What God has done is he's told you in advance where this thing is going. I have already defeated him. I've already decapitated him. I've already overruled him. Yeah, he beat you yesterday, but that's not where this thing is going because I have superimposing power to raise you up. Yeah, it looks like the recession is in control, but I said I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. I, my God shall supply all your needs according to the reason I told you where this thing is going. When you pray, oh Lord, the devil's beating me, that's not, that's half a prayer. You got to finish that prayer. The devil's beating me, but you told me back at Calvary where this thing is going. And you promised me greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Stop half praying to God. Giving him half of the story. They beat me up at the job. They beat me up at home. My kids beat me up. My mates beat me up. The economies beat me up. Hey, help me in Jesus' name. Amen. That, what kind of praying is that? That's a prayer from somebody who thinks Jesus is still hanging on the cross. He's been raised from the dead. He's seated on the right hand side of the Father. You can now come to him with authority, even though the rulers seem powerful, because authority overrules power. Somebody ought to bless him, because you came in here defeated, but you're going to leave here in victory. You came in here lost, but you're going to leave found, because now you know who you are because of the cross, which has defeated the evil one. Bless his name in here today. Even if you have a bad week, bless his name. Even if you had a bad day, bless his name. Even though your money is funny, bless his name. Even though you're struggling in some area, bless his name. Because he's already told you where this thing is going. In fact, I just want to pray for you and celebrate with you because you heard today that Jesus Christ has already defeated the enemy. He's taken the bullets out of the gun and now he can only rule by intimidation because greater is he that's in you. You're no longer a victim. You're, you're going to be a victor. And what he has postured for you won't happen. It will not have the final word. It has to go through his hands first.